I don't know if you guys remember this, but yes, in addition to Sean reciprocating by buying him on a car, my reciprocation. Oh God! For what? <laughs> what the hell? Did well, you I just do? what I did was I came in one day and I went down, sat down to play video games at the the, the station that we had, and there was nothing left. And him was like, "Oh, I sold them all at cash converters." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, "Oh." Okay. <laughs> oh wait, and they were all yours. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So well, that yeah. was that was nice. Of that you, was right? nice of me. Yeah. I'm just saying that, was that we all reciprocate uh, in different we ways. Did. We all reciprocate in different ways. <laughs> right. Cash, you know, cash converters. Cash converters. Uh, we sold a lot of gear too to pay for the first tour. Yeah. Cash converter. Cash converters is or was I think a larger Very, a literal corporation a corporation (laughs) it's a corporate a corporate pawn shop yes which was down the street from the porn shop in i think little ferry and you would go depends on how you search for it yeah you're either going to either one it depends on how you spell if you're a good speller yeah i don't know you might you might just end up at both there's a a small line between pawn and porn and santa and satan right (laughs) yes yes and satin and satin yeah So welcome to the Casual Interactions podcast. Uh, we are going to continue with our origin story. I'm John Hambone, and with me, as always, is Frank Iero and Sean Simon. How are you doing today, Frank? I'm doing good. I'm hopped up on Red Bull. Oh, I peeing can't. like like I a can't. madman. I can't drink that stuff. Well, I, I used to be off it, but now I'm back on. Yeah. How about You're you? Sh- back on the bull. I'm, I'm, rag- I'm riding the bull. Back on the bull. <laughs> riding the bull again. How are you doing, Sean? What? I'm good, man. Yeah. Thanks. I'm 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 drinking it though because I'm I'm getting prepared. I'm going to go see the Red Bulls play with my daughter Cherry. Oh, I'm cool! Very excited about what this. are the Red Bulls? They're a soccer team. It's and you go a, down to the soccer stadium, Harrison. This is going to be my first time down there. Okay, cool. I support Liverpool LFC, and they came over and they played like a preseason exhibition game. Mm. And I went and got tickets, and me and my friends went, and it was awesome. And then I noticed that Cherry was like really upset. She like really wanted to go, and so I was like, oh man! I was like, well. What if we went to, you know, like a soccer team here and the local team is the Red Bulls? I mean, you, there's a, like a there's a New York City team as well, but the Jersey team is the Red Bulls. So we're going to go see them. See, that was the one thing we always had in the studio back in the day was Red Bull because I was working in a bar and I made fast friends with the Red Bull distributor. So nice. I just kept up in the orders for him. Uh-huh. And then suddenly he'd be like, oh, hey, I'm out in the parking lot. Can I talk to you for a second? And he would just <laughs> pop the pop the back of the truck open and there'd be just put cases of Red oh, Bull in yeah. my car. <laughs> they did like a weird flavored ones that were really good too. Oh, there's a lime one that's pretty good. Yeah. I had that recently. I should probably like just stick to coffee, but man, sometimes you just gotta ride that bull. <laughs> is Red Bull and vodka, is the Red Bull and vodka thing? I haven't had one of those in a really long time. But is that still like real bad for you? That's Where why they, I don't. They change that. I don't. They know. change their stance on that yet. That's why I barely remember Las Vegas. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so today we're going to talk a little bit more about our origin story, and what we're going to talk about is touring and traveling because touring mm-hmm. and traveling now is very different than touring and traveling back when we were uh, first a band. Yes. You needed an atlas. An atlas. Yeah, and an abacus. <laughs> abacus. Yeah. Yeah. But any, any, a lot of things starting with A and ending in... Sean, are you uh, any good at reading maps? I have a pretty good sense of direction. Do you really? I don't know about out in the middle of Iowa, <laughs> but around here I do. I'm terrible. Terrible. I can't even... I can't get up from this chair and go find the, the bathroom without yeah. a GPS. Yeah. It's a good thing you drew a map. <laughs> I can't even read it. Yeah. <laughs> so we squiggles. We traveled a lot uh, as a band. We did travel a lot as a band. We went through, I'm going to say there was the original Pansy Prep band. Madame yes. Yellow was the original band. Uh-huh. That's what Yellow we Submarine. Did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember my mom got really mad about that one day because we had a, I had an air freshener of a, a topless girl. And she's uh. like, what if, the, what if the neighbors see it? <laughs> she's like, mom, they know I'm in a band. I'm a bad boy. Mom, I'm in a band. There's going to be tits. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, I mean, hey, look, back in the day at car washes, that's, oh, you had two choices of air fresheners. True. You had the pine trees or you had the tits. Yeah. So we, we went in another direction and I got mm-hmm. yelled at by my mother. Mm. Tit trees. Tit trees. There you go. There you go. Sundries and tit trees. <laughs> um, so yeah, we had the that we had that first one. Do you remember the the paint job that our friend Marco put on the Madame Yellow after Thanksgiving? Oh no, what was it? It was vomit. Oh, it that's right. There. Yeah, he threw up. On he it? threw. Here's what happened. We we all went out because big drinking night is the, the night before the Thanksgiving. Night before Thanksgiving. Yeah, everybody comes home. 
colleges or whatever. And we all went out and our friend Marco was around. We all went out drinking and you drove Marco home. I shouldn't have driven him home. And he leaned out and just painted the side of the van. And I think out of spite, we left it. <laughs> you said that he had to clean it. I did say he had to clean <laughs> that it. That was like, yeah, that was your stance on it. You're like, no, no one cleans it. Marco has to clean it. <laughs> and we, we didn't see Marco. <laughs> we didn't see For Marco a very long time. <laughs> he was, he was embarrassed. Yeah. He moved. <laughs> you were like, yo, this is a lesson that yeah. he has to learn. But yeah, it, I don't think it affected him. No, he, <laughs> really? he, he, he didn't care. It's, it's funny because earlier that year, he like was... Earlier that year, he was really thankful because I took him to Maxwell's to go see Seven Year Bitch. Okay. And I introduced him to Joan Jett, and he had no idea who Joan Jett was. Now, this mm. is this is so many years ago. It was a Seven Year Bitch Pansy Division, and Joan Jett was, I think, living in Hoboken at the time, so she, she wow. used to just go to shows. Yeah. So he's sitting outside. He got too hot in the club for him. And I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm actually talking to Joan Jett, and I was like, hey, don't go anywhere. I ran outside. I grabbed him, and I was like, you need to come inside right now. You got to meet Joan Jett. He goes, who's Joan Jett? And I just <laughs> stopped dead in my tracks, and I look at him, and I say, Marco... <laughs> When you figure this out tomorrow, you are going to be really happy that I'm a good friend. Come here. So also, I just want to say we do not advocate drinking and driving. Don't drink and drive. Always call an Uber or a Lyft, whatever kind of ride sharing service you have. We've made a lot of mistakes, so you don't have to. We don't advocate drinking and meeting Joan Jett. Yeah. Oh, no, I highly advocate drinking and meeting Joan Jett. Listen, I... I I totally. I totally asked Joan Jett for her number because you know what? You wow. missed a thousand percent of the shots you don't take. There you go. Yeah. No, it wasn't that happening. Go? It, it was. Well, she's like, oh, you're so cute. And she gave me a hug and a kiss on the cheek. And Aww. she's like, you're so nice. She's Aww. like, she's like, you're a little too young for me. And I'm like, total crush. No. Yeah. Yeah. But I, look, I, why not? Well, I mean, I dragged this, I dragged that jabroni in to meet Joan Jett. He didn't know who she was. The next day, though, he's like, oh my God, I can't believe I met Joan Jett. I'm like, you're welcome. <laughs> Man. So, yeah, he puked on the side of the van. That was the first Pensy Prep van. Then we had another van that was like a fly by night van that was the first like a line van that we had. And we shared between like Pensy Prep and my cam. That came from Dan Parks. That came from Dan Parks. Yes. And that quickly died. It had a, is that the one that had a loft on top? Actually, I'm sorry. That was the second account line van. It came from Dan Parks. The first one was the Lawrence Arms the van. The first one was the Lawrence Arms That's van. Right. That's what it was. So the Lawrence Arms were passing through on tour, yeah. and they were partying at the local party house with all mm-hmm. of us, and their van died. And this is, I think, right around the time Agony and Apathy came out. Okay. And that, um, Don't fact check me on that, but if you Google it, it, it's the record with Apathy in the title. It's really good. It's got porno and snuff films on it. And... Their van died on the side of the road. They're like, well, if anyone wants to go get it, they could just have the van. We'll just give <laughs> yeah. it to you because our, lab, our label is going to buy us a new van or something along those lines. We were drinking. So I was like, this is a great idea because their van was sweet and it had yes. like a TV in it mm-hmm. and it had a hookup for video games and like the captain's chairs. So we went, we got it, and I, I paid to have it fixed and it ran for a while. So that was the first My Chem van. Everyone van. That everyone was the, van. That was the van. hostage. We went up to Massachusetts, Sean, with the that's hostage right. in that van. Yeah. And that's that's where one of our friends brought a bunch of drugs across state lines <laughs> and didn't tell me till they got there because they knew I'd be mad. <laughs> yeah, well, you don't tell somebody about that. Also, don't, <laughs> don't, don't bring drugs across state lines, people. It's it's a bad idea. Uh, so then, yeah, then so that van died. Then he had the Dan Parks van. Yes. Dan Parks was a friend through Eddie Alletta. And so thankful he gifted us an old Conaline van. Yeah. And that got us through a little bit of touring as well like you know tri-state touring i think uh i mean maybe the farthest we went down was maybe baltimore with it right and up to connecticut boston or something like that correct me on this one was it the parks van or was it the lawrence arms van that you would have to keep your feet on the center console because the fan like that kept the motor running would try to come into the van that was the parks van that was the parks van okay yeah, yeah. Every, every van had their different death trap different death <laughs> yeah, trap things like mouse trap yeah. dude yeah the pensy van had the the gas seal mm-hmm. yes the the lawrence arms van it just would overheat a lot it would just constantly overheat but it would overheat like when you were going at like low speeds i'm also positive that something was dead in there we couldn't find out what it was because it was like this weird sweet smell of decay that there was a sweet smell of decay was, in was that, that the, the the one that when I was on tour with you guys, that we had a tuna fish sandwich in there that we called Sweet Chubby. That wasn't tuna fish. That was sausage. <laughs> it was sausage. It was a it was a was link it? of sausage <laughs> that was shrink wrapped, <laughs> and it was called Sweet Chubby. 
That, <laughs> yeah, that I think was the Parks van. I think that was the Parks van. Okay. But yeah, sweet chubby. Right. Holy shit. Yeah, each each van had their own disastrous breakdown story. In yeah. a past episode, we did tell the story about breaking down in Minneapolis. The final ride of the Pansy Prep van, though, do you guys remember this? It oh, was, please. Yes. I was playing in a band called Sleep Station at the time, and my chem uh, was up and coming, and we were going to play the Walk Together, Rock Together Fest on Long Island. We had some of us in our friend JJ's car. Mm-hmm. The rest of us were in the Pensy Prep van with all the gear, and we're driving down the Long Island Expressway, and Oof. the Pensy Prep van dies. Was Pensy not playing that show? Because I feel like Pensy played that show as well. I don't think I no. was there. Sean, no? Sean was. This is like the one adventure Sean there. wasn't oh, on with man. us. No. All right, and it would have been better if you were there. <laughs> I agree. So this is this is back in the day when uh, oh, Stacker shit. Two still had Trucker Speed in it. Mm-hmm. Oh my God! Yeah, I took that shit. And uh, yeah, and Sean and Sean <laughs> Hines. Sean oh, Hines God. was there with us too uh, on that trip because we broke down Center Lane on the Long Island Expressway. Uh, and so they actually had a Literally, cops. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but literally the worst road in the world. The absolute like, worst road in the world. Fuck, man. It's that and that and the and 495 going down into DC. You don't want to break down there. Yeah, no. So we broke down center lane. The cops had to come and they had to shut the entire highway down to mm. push the van off to the side of the road. Oh, yeah. So we ordered a pizza and had it delivered <laughs> to the side of the road. <laughs> I had AAA plus, so well, I, you had a triple A. I think someone else had a triple A, yeah. and I had so we all can we could combine the mileage like a triple A Voltron. Yeah. And we made the gig that night. We actually had the van with all the gear towed to the show. The show. We just took what we needed and put it in JJ's car and sent the band that was supposed to be on first in the lineup ahead in the mm-hmm. car. And the rest of us arrived there, and then we got the van towed back to the rehearsal space. Best part of that that story as well is that not everyone could fit in the second car yeah so myself and i think th- two or three other people hid in the van oh yeah as it got towed yeah. underneath the gear <laughs> like a, like a han solo smuggler the spot fucking most dangerous thing in the <laughs> oh, world. so stupid so stupid and frank you know thank you because you rode back so i wouldn't have to ride alone to jersey with the van in the tow truck oh with me. yeah and then the large guy, marge dude large marge and then the guy wanted to tip and we're like we don't have any money we yeah just, look at us we just linked a bunch of triple a cards together to get home <laughs> to get to a gig that didn't pay us yeah <laughs> like, yeah fucking crazy jeez jeez yeah so we're talking about tour stories and the difficulties that go into touring you know back then when we started touring maps Mm -hmm. road atlases yes maybe one person in the band had a cell phone maybe someone had like a game boy for entertainment and that was really it the internet wasn't so much of a thing where you could get in contact with different promoters you'd have to constantly call clubs Mm -hmm. you'd have to constantly if you had an email like no one was able to oh, I'm going to reach into my pocket and pick up my phone and check my email. Like a, a club promoter or a booker would have to physically be sitting in front of their computer checking emails from right. bands. So you would have a tour, and I'm going to do air quotes here for people listening at home, booked. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe. Possibly. And, and you would just, you're just, it's a crapshoot and you're hoping for the best. Mm-hmm. Stopping at payphones and hoping to check back in, but you really didn't see that person from when you, air quotes again, booked the show till when yeah. you showed up at hopefully the right address. Right. And there was a show there. So when we were coming up, you know, not a lot of bands from the area actually ever left town and went on tour. Right. Because you had the spirit, you had the want, you had the desire to do it. No one was really doing it. Like, people were big. There was a lot of bigger bands, but they were bigger, like, local. Like, they would pack mm-hmm. in the M&M Hall. They'd pack in the Wayne Firehouse. Mm-hmm. Right. Garfield. The, the Garfield. Mm-hmm. They weren't actually leaving town too often. Maybe going to New York, maybe going to Connecticut. Maybe their cousin knows someone at a club in Baltimore. They'd go down. Yeah. But that was the extent of it. You know, we in our group we were some of the first people to get up and get the hell out of town i remember like being in a high school band and i was in a band called sector 12 and uh we got a we we landed a gig in like connecticut opening for the pie tasters or something like that and it was like we're going on fucking tour <laughs> you know what <laughs> i mean and we all just jumped in like somebody's old like oldsmobile dad's old mobile and drove up there and it was like I mean, we had that show and then maybe a show in like Upper Jersey on upper the way Jersey. home. And that was, yeah. you know, that was like, I was like, we're on tour. And it was the greatest feeling in the world. And that's how I knew that I would dedicate my, my life to this no matter what. Yeah, you went to Connecticut <laughs> and then you went up to Randolph yeah. to play Obsessions and you had to yeah, sell yeah, tickets. Yeah, totally. And then oh. you told the promoter, oh no, someone stole them from me and you played anyway. Oh, I have a great Obsession story, by the way. Do tell. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, if anybody's ever been to it, I don't, is that place still even there? I don't There's even know. No, can't be. It can't be. Yeah. All right, so anyway, playing a show at Obsessions, again, I think either Pie Tasters or, God, 
one of those moon ska bands that like ended up being like blue band group where it was like never anybody from the original band right like, just like yeah these yeah. these factions playing in all different places so opening up for a ska band having to sell 150 tickets sold maybe five of them because nobody would spend the money on it and we broke down and ended up actually no we didn't break down Bruno was in this band with me. It was actually instrumental in, in getting Pensy all together and bringing us together as friends. He got pulled over. And so I stopped with him, ahead of him, to like let him know where the club was. And as I got out of the car, the cop arrested me. What? Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. The cop arrested me because he was like, you can't approach someone else being pulled over. Uh, but I just wanted to tell him, hey, listen, it's up on the right. Uh, yeah. But he got like freaked out and like threw me in the back of the cop car. Because oh, there's, there's no real text messaging back then. No. And so wow. then they took whatever car I was in to the show. Bruno left. And then I arrived at Obsessions in the back of a cop car at the gig. <laughs> yeah, wow. street cred level yeah. over 9,000. Wow, and then I remember this. I remember getting out, being let out of the cop car and de-shackled yeah. and then <laughs> walking into the club and some kid in line going, that's an entrance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. It's kind of what I imagine, like, the catalyst for you actually getting out of the back of a armored truck for the VMAs that one year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. Just at a much smaller scale. <laughs> yeah. Imagine, like, showing up like a badass, like, in shackles, out of a cop car, and then you get up and play, like, emo pop punk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, Real nasally yeah. singing about feelings. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the whole G.G. Allen entrance and no, the actual yeah, stage yeah. show just doesn't... Yeah, like, oh, this guy's definitely going to get up on stage and eat his own shit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, no. <laughs> no, he just got hurt once. <laughs> so, Sean, what was your first touring experience like? What was the, f- the first Pensy tour, right? Right. Yeah. How old were we at that point? 19? 19, 19 20? I think I was 22. At the time. I was 21, almost 22. So we were what then, 20? Yeah, I'm two years older. Okay. Yeah. So I was like 22, you guys were like 20. Was that the first time you'd really been out of town, Sean? I mean, except on like family vacations and stuff, yeah. Right, but I mean for like something other than family vacation. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. You know, coming into being in a band where we we just kind of wanted to hang out with you more to now we're actually <laughs> going to like hop in a van together and, and go see the country. We got him on tour too. We were like, "Hey, Sean, help us move this couch real quick," and just shoved him in a van. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, we got free puppies in here. You want to come see it? <laughs> yeah. Like, did you actually like tell your parents you were leaving, Sean, or you just like disappeared just for called, like a week? Called them a week later. Yeah. yeah. That sounds about right. Yeah. Oh man, my first tour right was actually with my father. Really, my father's band was uh, touring down in Virginia at Virginia mm. Beach, and they were doing like a week of shows down there and stuff like that and i remember going down and teching for him and i was like maybe 15 that's wow. cool so you yeah. started as a roadie i started as a roadie yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome yeah see that's super cool so i mean i i traveled before like i'd gone on trips with my friends uh when i was like 17 18 but that was the first for me tour as mm-hmm. well and you know of course the the label we were on at the time i i would ask like a bunch of questions like what should we do what should we do with this and they were like i don't know just do whatever like just so useless when it came to kind of giving any kind of advice or leadership <laughs> towards what we were supposed to do. So we were, I think, wildly un- unprepared for it. Oh, definitely. Like, well, Neil had toured a little bit, but not yeah. not like this. Right. I think he led on more than he actually did. You know what I mean? I think right. that was like a... He had been in a band... He was in a band called Stick Figure Suicide. Right. And they had done... They were they had got, gotten some popularity and, and done some, some things. So I feel like we looked to him for... You know, like, all right, well, how do we do this kind of thing? What do we do? Right, and he and booked the tour. He did book the tour, yeah. He had he had connections and stuff like that. But I think, you know, as a young person, when you have a little bit of experience, yeah. you know, you get you feel that sense of power. So you start to, like, stand up a little bit taller. Oh, like, yeah, You'd be able to tell everybody what to do kind of yeah. thing, you know? So uh, I think th- there was a little bit of that. But I think really, truly, none of us really knew what the fuck we were doing. Oh, no, not, not, yeah. at, not at that level. And then the people that we did look to were just... They had nothing for us. They had no yeah. advice. They had nothing. You know, I would call them from like the road, be like, well, this is going on. Like, what should we do? They're like, I don't know, man. Whatever. Do whatever you think Figure you should out. do. Figure it out. Yeah. And you know what? In hindsight, a lot of that really was good. It's good advice for life because you have to be able to think on the fly in a lot of situations. You have to be able to kind of adjust and adapt to some situations. But man, a little heads up would have been nice. Yeah, but think about it like this, right? When we were young, right? right? Like, how old were you? Uh, how old were your parents when you were born? Oh, man. Um, so I'm 40, so they're like 30. 30, right? Yep. Did you have a fucking clue as to what you were doing at 30? Oh, God, no. No. So neither did your parents. They just <laughs> yeah, fucking faked true. it. You that's know what I mean? true. Like, 
I have kids now, yeah. and they think I'm an adult, yeah. and that I know what the fuck I'm doing. <laughs> right. Don't, don't, no fucking clue. Right. Don't play this for them. <laughs> no, well, yeah, I mean, eventually they're going to hear it, and they're going to get, it, but they're going to understand later yeah. on. No, I, I, when they, yeah, you're right. Kids. You're absolutely right. You're just, you're just trying to keep them alive and not die yourself. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like that's really essentially. <laughs> hopefully, you smile more than you frown, but you have no fucking clue what you're doing. Yeah, and neither did we. So we went out, we yeah. hit the road, we did the thing, we made the towns barely. Mm-hmm. And we came back with less money in our pockets than when we left. Definitely. So all in all, I think it was a successful first tour because we learned a lot for for us to be able to get out there and to acquire the knowledge. Because then after that, man, one one under your belt, yeah, you're that's, just you are then so you can, much better. Then your posture is a little bit straighter, and you can tell everybody else <laughs> right. what the fuck's going on because you did a tour, you toured, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I, when I toured, when I toured, I mean, no, no, you know, yeah, it's I, great because you see bands at like local clubs. Yeah, like, well, I feel like I need to to go on later because I have work the next day, and I'm like, yeah, whatever, jerk. <laughs> like what? I was like, well, when's the last time you left town? Well, we went on tour. Where'd you go? Well, we went to New York and we went to Connecticut. That's not a tour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 so like, <laughs> Who, who'd you definitely ever start be? judging people? Yeah, <laughs> my favorite too now is like when you see like uh people like you know local shows and stuff like that or whatever and they have like the laminates just oh, still hanging. Yeah. <laughs> like oh right. remember those yeah, kids used to have yeah, like yeah. laminates hanging and you're like and when you're younger you're like oh my god look they got laminates they <laughs> shit. and now you're just like you fucking jerk <laughs> get that fucking laminate off you yeah come on you know you don't you don't bring you don't wear the title belt around the airport come on yeah you know you know what that's we, just a luggage tag that's just a luggage tag <laughs> your mom's address is on it it's not even yours you don't even own the house when we were when we were younger though we had a, a kinko's around the corner from my house so oh. we would actually make all our own flyers at kinko's mm. and we'd go in there and we would see bands that were going on the air quotes tour and they were making their laminates there at kinko's when we were making flyers for our shows because we'd make flyers for the shows that we were going to go do in the towns we were going to, and then we'd walk around and we'd hand out flyers yep. uh, to try to get more people to come out to the show. So it wasn't just, well, Neil booked this tour. It's what happened when you got to town, because you got a lot of hours to kill for people who maybe have never been in a band or been in a position where they have to go and do a sound check and they're from out of town and you got to get there like four or five o'clock in the afternoon to do a sound check maybe seven o'clock at night you're not going on to midnight it's called hurry up and wait because yeah. you're going to be you're rushing to get to the club and then you're there and then all you can do is drink or go get a sandwich somewhere because there's nothing else happening until you get to get on stage at night mm-hmm. and i feel like too back then it was uh a lot because you you want it to be there when doors you didn't know when you were going to be able to get right. in and load in and stuff like that and then also you would have to load in and then have to wait around for you know the sound guy who who was usually and i'm not saying that to all sound guys but habitually <laughs> usually this uh, the sound guy is a fucking mess yeah and <laughs> but acts like you know because everybody's for some reason i don't know why but I worked for Maiden. Like yeah. they all worked for Maiden <laughs> yeah. at some point. Maiden's a major corporation at this point. <laughs> yeah. It's like saying I work for Target, you know, and they have no time for your shit yeah. no matter who you are. Nope. You're doing it wrong. Mm-hmm. Your equipment sucks. You're too fucking loud. Too loud. <laughs> <laughs> and they have the best equipment, but somehow they can't get the vocal over the fucking <laughs> over the guitar sound. <laughs> so, uh yeah, that's that's the other thing. It's like, "Oh, right, you got to hurry up, wait for the sound guy that you're going to eventually fight with." Oh yeah. I was in about a show that you should all be in, like in, on the same team, trying to make a good show. Yeah, absolutely. They don't fucking give a shit about you. No, <laughs> I, I will say though, I was at Hank Saloon the other night playing a gig, and the sound guy comes up, and I'm like, oh, I get it, I'm too loud. He goes, No, you should turn up. And I, I looked, at, I looked at him, I'm like, What kind of bizarro fucking world are we living yeah. in right now? Uh, it, you know, and he was like, Listen, man, I want everyone to have a good time. I want to make sure that you sound the best, so I sound the best. And he's like, So let's let's work together. And I was like, Where are you? And where have you been all my entire yeah. music career? <laughs> Seriously, because I'm usually running into some weird racist <laughs> yeah. fucking dude who has does not like. He would much rather just mix nothing. Yeah. <laughs> like you just want. I want no one here. So I can mix the radio, I guess. I don't know who you really are preferring to mix. Yeah, I used but. to have a running tally that I would keep uh, in my guitar case of how many sound guys had come across that nodded off at the soundboard. Oh my god! Like you could actually you see them, and at first, like you know, they're their heads down, they're looking at the board because it's it's dark in most of these clubs, and they're looking at the board, and you see them, they're kind of nodding their head, and like you're like, oh man, maybe they're digging the music, and then like their head doesn't come back up, and they're just kind of standing there. And you're like, oh, oh, he's nodding off. He's nodding off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. got it. Yeah, he he thinks we suck. Yeah. That's why I'm looking at cat videos. On yeah, we didn't Instagram. we didn't change that. <laughs> Shit. 
Yeah. So all right, here, here's my thing too. Like as far as going back to the Atlas, right, right, and maps. Uh, back then, when we start start first started touring, like you had to buy those. Oh yeah. Now you go to a rest stop. They try to. They please take a map. They're they? free. Yeah. They're, really. You just take one, please. We they, have all this paper printed. They printed so no many. One wants it, and they don't want to recycle <laughs> yeah. it. They just like please yeah. just take these maps. Like someone is going to need to use a map At one some day. Point. Yeah. No. Well, you know, eventually later on, you know, after. Uh, you went off to my camp. I still, I went back and I started playing with Neil again. I was playing in a band called Fairmont with him, which he still does to this oh, day. Oh, that's right. You did that. Yeah, I did. I think I did like five or six years in Fairmont. I forgot about that. Fairmont's been around for, geez, I don't know, was like 12, 15 years. Was that before we did the hostage? It was right after we did the hostage. Right after. Yeah. And uh, I toured with Neil for years and the tours would get better. And it's not uh, an indictment on Neil's ability to book a tour. It's just that the technology got better. Yeah. So it was easier for him to communicate with the clubs. You'd actually have people checking their emails more, people in front of their computers more, cell phones started happening. So people would actually, oh, oh yeah, you're coming in? Oh yeah, totally. Here's what's going on. So it went from you hope you have a gig to you're sure you have a gig too. Oh, we definitely have a gig. Mm -hmm. Here's how much we're getting paid. Here's what's expected to us. And we actually printed out these maps from MapQuest. Oh man, yeah. On how to get to how to get to the the next town. That was the upgrade from the Mm -hmm. the old maps and the atlases. (laughs) Do you think the people that printed like the maps and atlases like were at like Y two K were like, oh fuck, (laughs) like this is our chance. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Everything's gonna go down, they'll need us again. (laughs) No? Yeah, and that bat signal never went up for them, did it? It's crazy too because I, you know, touring with you, we when we did Leathermouth, mm-hmm. uh, we had uh, Vic, who was the driver, and like you never saw a map in front of Vic. Vic knew uh, every road yeah. like the back of his hand. Yeah. I look at Google now when they do the the little Google cars that do the street view of everything. Right. Like how many years it must have taken to get the street view of pretty much every street in America. Like it's crazy to think that's been going on for years. And now, like yeah. if I if I'm trying to find someone's house or if I'm trying to find like a pizzeria, if I Google it, they actually show the map and they show the building that I'm looking for. Mm. That's crazy. Yeah. Now, nah, if you told me that as a kid, I'd be like, "Well, am I going to get a flying skateboard?" Yeah. No, you can't figure that out, right? You can't figure you out a hoverboard. Fucking picture of everybody's goddamn house. <laughs> you can't get a flying skateboard. You know, I will say this too about uh, Neil's hustle. He had that shit down where like he got me and sean jobs at staples he did oh fuck and this was i mean if, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if this is still like a really good idea for bands now but i think it is this was imperative to like building pensy was us working at staples and robbing them blind for making flyers and just just, <laughs> and just fucking with customers just fucking I with mean, cu- we well had, that yeah that had a lot definitely helped yeah but like we we would make flyers and yeah. merch like we would make stickers and yeah. magnets and fucking t-shirt transfers and shit that we would just pretend it was for other customers and make it for our band yeah no it was great i mean the first batch of pensy prep t-shirts that we made we yeah. silk screened in my basement i got the silk screening gear that i borrowed from my friend livio from down the block because mm-hmm. he took me to pearl paint and i ran into him the other night at a concert in oh, montclair nice. and i'm so grateful to him because he turned me on to a lot of cool stuff and he taught me how to silk screen. Mm. So he took me to Pearl Paint. He lent me some gear, and then you guys come back with this the transfer that we made the silk screen with. Mm-hmm. You know, but that's what bands don't don't do anymore uh, because most people don't steal. They, oh no, they <laughs> well, you know, a- allegedly they don't steal. <laughs> Stealing's bad. Uh, no, I they, feel like the statute of limitations is up. We could talk. Oh uh, yeah, it. I mean it's been almost it's right. been twenty years. Prove it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> where's your, where, where's the security footage, guys? Yeah. Come on, and that and that's not a challenge. That is not. I'm not daring anybody to do that. <laughs> uh, you know the thing is bands now they it's it's all Facebook promoting on Instagram yeah. Twitter like you know the idea of us 20 years ago even 10 years ago like walking around a town that we've never been in before and flyering yeah flyering going to record stores like stapling posters to stuff it does it doesn't exist yeah. it doesn't exist anymore well that was the thing too is like we were able to to barter with promoters yeah like be like hey listen like put us on this show we'll do all your flowering for you yeah you know what i mean and it wouldn't cost us anything because we would be at work making shit for our band making yeah. shit for your band anyway yeah that was amazing yeah and I you know, we did the first like demo layouts and shit like we that did, too yeah. there right? we did the whole yeah. demo, the first demo layouts like the, the ones that we hand cut ourselves yeah. and put into jewel cases that we stole from like other cds that we had lying around the house <laughs> yeah i did that shit like later on too uh I, for like a death spells i did like a i did a band with james Dewey's called death spells and we did like a cassette release where i did i did all that shit at kinko's myself and i yeah. did like a blood nun thing with my other friend uh, that it just brought me back to those nights of us, you know, 
either stealing from Staples where we worked together or or being at the Kinko's by your house. And right. Just like hand cut. That was the fucking coolest, funnest time. You were yeah, three o'clock in the morning at an all night Kinko's yeah. making demos. Well, right. and we felt we used to take turns napping underneath the counter at yep. Kinko's yeah. because it was 24 hours at the time and it was right yeah. next to the diner. I, I mean, I was, that was, I was bar backing at the time. So I just worked like a double and... We practiced all day, then I worked a double, and then we met up at Kink- we met up at Kinko's at like I don't know it was like eleven thirty at night, twelve o'clock at night, mm-hmm. and we printed till like three o'clock in the morning, and we mm-hmm. napped, and the next day we got up, we went on tour. You know that's the spirit and the the beauty of the the DIY ethic to me, where it's not so much necessity; it's fun. Yeah, it's something it means more. Too. It means more. Yeah, you you know what it is to put those miles on your feet when you're just trying to get someone to show up other than the bartender and the bartender's girlfriend right. who's really not happy to be there to watch <laughs> yeah. your band play. Yeah. So, you know, things are different now and I wouldn't say that they're better. I just think it's different. Well, I have a question, right? Like, is there a scene now still? Is it different? I mean, I've seen a few like smaller shows like in New York City and stuff like that, but I feel like the the Jersey one, I, I, I'm f- too far removed. You know, I I was for uh, like maybe a couple of years ago, like when uh, when my brother-in-law Evan was, was right. in science and he was doing uh, shows locally and stuff like that. I got a little bit more accustomed to like the bands that were doing it and uh, and all that. But I feel like now, like I'm a little bit, I feel like it's changed so much in these just in in the past five years. Well, there's a big indie rock scene mm-hmm. now. I'm outside of it. I play in an outlaw country band called Secret Country now. Like I. That's not it's not my world. However, we intersect with a lot of these bands because we play a lot in Jersey City. Mm-hmm. And Jersey City is just a, a playground for bands to be playing live music. The same thing with like Asbury Park and other places. You know, Neil went on after doing Fairmont, he did a, he has a, a label called Mint Four Hundred. Mm-hmm. Where for like I, he's gotta be like ten years doing this now, where he wow. promotes and he helps build up local bands. He puts out their projects, he puts on showcases at a bunch of different bars. And it's not like when in back in the day you'd put on showcases, like these bands are hungry again. They're hungry and they will pack in I mean, they were doing stashes the other night in Fairlawn and the place was packed. And it's different bands, they're promoting, they're hustling, they're doing it differently though. See, that's fucking awesome. They're more tech savvy than we were. They're making like videos and Instagram videos right. and like little little movies movies and shit but yeah i mean he is kind of the the current like standard bearer for indie rock in new jersey mm-hmm. just really trying to get bands uh, over and he's doing a good job of it that's awesome i, I got a little disheartened i think when I, I was doing the skeleton crew label and I, I ran to a lot of bands that just didn't want to put in the work they just were like oh well, you know you're in a big band like you're gonna put our record out and just bring us on tour and then we're gonna be big right it's like, yeah no because well, they thought because they they were associated with you who was super over at the time and you know i mean at that was skeleton crew so you had uh with the black parade hadn't happened yet right it was just on the precipice of happening i don't know it's it's right around, it's right around that time i mean people yeah. people definitely knew who my chemical romance was yeah so you have bands that are coming up that just you're right they don't want to do the work you know say what you will about springsteen he had a great quote once where he said it's not getting signed that getting signed shouldn't be the end because it, it doesn't stop when you get signed. No. It, it's what happens after you get signed. Yeah. So just because you get signed to a smaller label, a mid-tier label, a top-tier label like Warner Brothers, you got to do the work. Mm-hmm. And if you're not going to put in the work, then you're not going to get anything out of it. I mean, maybe the lightning does strike you and you're the one person who gets famous off of making some goofy video for a song. But that's but after that, man, you know, you got to put the time in. Yeah, I just, yeah, I didn't, I don't know, it didn't make me want to to put in any effort to help bands that didn't want to help themselves you yeah know? you had great t-shirts though oh thanks yeah i i can i can do a merch i yeah. can do some merch you merch that i can do <laughs> you merch like a motherfucker <laughs> yeah i'll merch the shit out of you. <laughs> no but that, like that's that's fun for me like the design of it yeah i i really wanted so much to like do that thing where you help bands like become what they wanted to become right. and, and get them to where they wanted to be and and it bummed me out to see like a lot of bands just be like oh well you do it for me yeah you do it yeah, like, you know, we, we did it the hard way. When yeah. me, you and Sean did that first tour, we did everything the hard way. So if you get to that point where, yeah, maybe there is catering, or maybe you get a per diem or a buyout, or maybe you get a rider, or like, you know, a promoter actually promotes that you're going to yeah. be coming to the town. Like, you earn that. Did we ever get a rider? We never got anything. Not in Pensy. Fuck no. Because no. <clears throat> I remember the first time I ever got anything was on my cam, and we, 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 we didn't know we could lunch. ask for anything. Oh, yeah. Somebody oh, yeah. told us, like, hey, do you want to call ahead and see if you can get chips and salsa? And we we're like, you can chips get chips and, and salsa? Chips and salsa. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was it. it. And then we called fucking everybody. And we're like, uh, can we get was. some chips and salsa? And they're yeah. like, oh, yeah, sure. We're like, holy shit. And then we, then there was a discussion, like, 
next time should we ask for peanut butter? <laughs> like, we just like kept going like that. Do you think dude. we can get a pizza? Yeah. Oh, no, nah, you can't get pizza. So, no. well, no, there, was, there crazy? was crazy. There was a few times. What are you, a maiden? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Oh, God. Well, there was a few times, I think, that we we did get treated pretty cool. So, the first big show that we had is Pensy Prep. Uh, I fast talked us onto the bill with not a surf at the Loop Lounge. Right. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. So, right. I got us on that and. Then I ended up working there for like seven, eight years afterwards. But that's that's a story for another day. <laughs> it became like an indentured servant. Yeah. I, I, I got oh, I, I got us on like one off. big show. Well, they they gave, they gave us oh two drink God. tickets apiece, right? Uh, and they definitely and asked. then they were like, "Now you can never leave. Now you can never leave." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh! And then oh, uh, well, Ricky Ricky took care of us when we played uh, with Not a Surf again at yeah. the Bomb Shelter yeah. show at yeah. the Wayne Firehouse. Uh, Ricky always Ricky was a independent promoter when we were younger, and he was our age, and he was putting on all the best shows at the Wayne Firehouse yeah. and a couple other places. I mean, this is the guy, the kid who brought Alkaline Trio to New Jersey. Yeah. He's the kid who brought Hot Water Music, Jimmy Eat World at the Drive In. At the Drive In, <laughs> I mean, you know, if there was a big independent band at the time. You know, we saw them at a local firehouse yeah. How for like is that, seven huh? bucks. Yeah. Jets of Brazil. I remember Jets seeing of Jets Brazil. Brazil on yeah. fucking Wayne Firehouse. But like that was the thing. Like that bomb shelter collective, man. Like Jamia, right? Uh, Pete Lack and Ricky, and like just that. That's what I guess you want to call it a scene. That was the or scene. That time yeah. was like unbelievable. I, yeah. th- that was the most education I ever. I went to college and high school and all that stuff, and never finished it and never learned a fucking thing. Nope. But in that like span of a couple of months going to see bomb shelter shows holy shit man it changed yeah. my entire fucking outlook on everything yeah we learned everything the hard way by hustling yeah. do you remember what the third and final like big show that we had was where we actually got treated right um it wasn't skate and surf well we, that was the biggest show that was we the ever biggest played. show we ever played but yeah, the, right. the one where we got treated real nice um no we opened for the strokes at maxwell's oh, oh shit, oh, shit. we opened for the right. strokes at maxwell's and maxwell's is great because they would give you beers yeah. and then each member of the band got a meal but it was like a good meal it wasn't like oh here's like the crap that's left over you had like a special band menu yeah but it was like the best food that you'd eat all week and then you played maxwell's which was an, a venue that was legendary in the state mm, of new jersey I and it held like venue. 200 people yeah. and you would also see your favorite bands play there so the strokes were just a they They just dropped a hit they had a demo out Uh, last night was about to come out and we somehow weasel our way onto that show it was our show we booked a show there oh that's what it was they added the strokes and a band called longview and longview Mm, i believe to the to the bill and of course they were like the you know buzz band of new york city but i don't think any of us had heard of the strokes at that point and um, we're like Who's this band that they added on? It, of course, the show sold out. We're like, we fucking did it! Look yeah. at us! <laughs> like people like us, <laughs> like a bunch of jerks. Right? Totally. Totally. Yeah. Oh, how wrong we were! Because <laughs> of course, no one was there when we played. Right. But it did fill up. No, no, no. What? Go they ahead. were there. They were all in the bar. bar. Yes, yes, yes. Wait, in the other room, because there was a bar in the room that we played, and there was a bar otherwise, and the place was packed. Like, we walked in, and we're like, oh my God, we're going to play for so many fucking people tonight. Yeah. And then we went, we sound checked, we came out, we had our dinner, we saw all these people, like, oh man, this is our night. Tonight's the night. And we go in there, and uh, I think whoever's girlfriends were there at the time, and like maybe my dad yeah. were the only people <laughs> yeah. watching us. Yeah. And then we get done, Longview comes up, and it's kind of like the same thing for them as well, but more people came in because yeah. they, they, they were a New York City band. They were a New York City band. And then the Strokes came on, and then there was no one in the outside bar where we were, and we yeah, just kind of, you know, we're mm. like, well, harumph. We, well, do you remember this? I, it I, looks good on a poster. We played with the Strokes. <laughs> we, while Longview was playing, we, we were downstairs, and we, um, it was after our set, and we were kind of like, still buzzing a little bit. We played. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that that was, that that, was the that's, thing. It wasn't that's even the about, like, people that's always being the high. there. Yeah. Right. It's not about people being there or liking music. That's, that's the fucking cherry on top. You just get to play, and that's the, like the drug that you you chase, you know, that high that you chase. And so you played, so you're still buzzing, you're feeling great. And some of the Strokes guys were there, and none of them were really talkative or all that nice. I think they were just a little bit off standish, except for the drummer, right, Fab. And we all, I don't know if you partook, but we all got high. Yeah, not why well, I didn't. And Bruno was there, our friend Bruno. Oh, God. And he took offense that they wouldn't talk to us do you remember this yeah, i remember this yeah. so uh-huh. then yeah so then the strokes went on stage and he stole all of their shoes yes <laughs> right so yeah got him <laughs> yeah we did oh, so we're gonna wrap up this episode on touring part three of our origin story as friends frank you got any last words on touring <laughs> oh jesus no i'm just 
You know what? We should, we should have a special where we in, we'll invite some friends. Right. I think from the past and see if we can interview them about these uh, times and see fun. if their their stories match up to ours. Right. Oh uh, yeah. Or we we invite them over and right. then it's like what's that guy that Chris guy where you, you invite pedophiles over and then they get arrested for <laughs> oh my crimes God. that we that we've <laughs> admitted Frank. like we were like hey hey uh, hey Bruno I would like to come have, come and get interviewed for our podcast <laughs> oh, and then like he's like oh yeah I stole their shoes and then like well Bruno we'd like to have you meet uh, Officer Giles here I'd like to talk to you about shoes uh, that you stole. Oh, yeah. shit. <laughs> Oh, uh, you know what? Uh, <laughs> I, I will say Bruno did very well for himself in life. He's got a beautiful yes. family, and I will always be grateful to him for bringing us all together. So cheers to you, Bruno. Thanks for being a part of what Miss we did. Miss you, man. I haven't seen him in forever. I'll tr- I could track him down. We'll get him on the show. All right. <laughs> track him down. Well, you know, I, I'm good at stuff. Yeah. yeah. How about Investigative you? stuff. How about you, Sean? Any last words on touring? I don't know, man. No. I remember later on when touring got to you, you were like, I am fucking done touring. And do you remember this? It was overseas. You were on tour with Mike. Oh, and I lost my fucking you shoe. You lost your shoe. In Germany somewhere. In on the Germany. Fucking road. Had one shoe. And one I like, shoe. I was like, get me the fuck home. I'm done, man. <laughs> yeah. I'm fucking done. That's what it takes though sometimes. Like you tour yeah. for a long time and, and you're out there and it's, you know, yes, it's you and your band and your friends versus the world. But sometimes it just gets the, tr- it's the travel. It, it is gets the travel. so much and then you lose your fucking shoe and well, you lose your goddamn right, mind. Well, what it was too was that it wasn't my band. And yeah. So I was like helping out with merch and, right, yeah. and, it, and Cutting hair. while it was fun, it was like, I'm not going to be this dude that just latches on. Right. You know yeah. what I'm saying? No, I hear you. Yeah. So it was like, I need to figure out my own shit. Yeah. Too. So that kind of added up to, to, to all of it too. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So. But yeah. also, if you have one shoe <laughs> well, yeah. and you're real far from home and yeah. you don't see like no, the prospect shitty. of another shoe yeah, coming, that's yeah. Yeah. Like, that's fu- that's, that's what fucking the shitty. fuck do you do? Yeah. Uh, it's over. Oh, <laughs> fuck. I'm fucking done now. Yeah. yeah. What else can the universe take from me? Yeah. Well, I, my hands? Was it was it the left one or the right one? I don't even know, man. Yeah. It was we we stopped what? we stopped the piss on the side of the road. And when we got Door back open. in, I was minus the shoe. Yep. <laughs> That'll do it. Think about it. Yeah. Now, try putting both feet in one shoe for the rest of the tour. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some, some people are good at hopping. Hop along. Yeah. So uh, that'll be it for the <laughs> Casual Interactions podcast. Uh, my words on touring are if you are in a band and you believe in yourself, invest in yourself, give it a try at least once. It is a lot easier now than it used to be. And it is a great way to see this beautiful country of ours and through the window a of a van. And pair of shoes. And bring a backup pair of shoes. Because <laughs> yeah. someone might steal them from you or you might lose one in a field somewhere. So, Frank, where can people find you? Uh, I am on Twitter at Frank Iero. I am on Instagram at Frank Iero Must Die. And I have a website, Frank Iero.com. Sean, what do you have out right now? Wizard Beach. Wizard, Wizard Beach. Yes. I, I, I keep forgetting of like the same thing. Also, too, like, aren't like art ops trades, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I write and, comics. So, there's like art ops and this Never Boy and this book called True Lives of the Fabulous Killjoys. And Wizard Beach is coming out soon. And there's other stuff in the works. So, buy Sean's comics. Yeah. You can find them wherever okay, your yeah. comic stores are. And by the time this episode does drop, Wizard Beach by Boom Comic will be out. And you are going to love it. So, for Frank Iero and Sean Simon, I'm John Hambone McGuire. Join us next month for another episode of Casual Interactions. Until then, hold on to your friends. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Every review helps other listeners find us. Casual Interactions is a ham-fisted production. Music by Dead Go West. Art by Stephen Blay.